church. Morning, happy Sabbath. How are you doing today? Excellent. Okay, as Sister Cara mentioned, my presentation today is about stewardship and money management. All right. And at first, we may question what is what or who is a steward. We talk a lot about stewardship. We have a whole department within our church dedicated to stewardship. But what is it all about? Oxford English Dictionary describes a steward as a person whose responsibility is to take care of something. Is to take care of something. Miriam Webster says, "One who actively directs or manages affairs." And as we look at steward, we also look at the definition of stewardship. And Miriam Webster's dictionary describes stewardship as the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the care and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Based on the setting that we're in, we can look at stewardship from a biblical standpoint. So what do we consider biblical steward or stewardship? In Councils on Stewardship, Ellen G. White stated that stewardship is properly managing the resources that God has committed to our care. Amen. And in the book Faith-Based Family Finances by Juan Blue, he indicated that stewardship is the use of God-given gifts and resources Amen. for the accomplishment of God-given gifts and objectives. And as we look at stewardship, we often correlate stewardship to money. But stewardship is not just about money. Stewardship can be defined with four T's. Some people say that there are five T's, but for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to use the four T's, and that is time. How do we manage the 24 hours that we all have within a day? How do we manage our talents? How do we use our talents to glorify God? How do we? use our temple, take care of our temple, which is our body? Do we put harmful substances to it? Do we practice illegal things, basically, that can affect our bodies? And treasure, how do we manage our financial resources? And as I go through this presentation, I want us to think about the four principles of biblical stewardship. They are ownership, responsibility, accountability and reward. In ownership, in Psalms 24, God says that the earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Amen. So as Christians, we know who owns everything that we have to our disposal. And, if, and though God owns everything, he gives us the responsibility to take care of the resources that he has granted unto us. And when he gives us that responsibility, we are accountable for how we manage those resources. Is it being done effectively? Are we wasting the resources that God has given to us? And then the reward. In Matthew 25, 21, after we will have managed those resources properly and we are we were going to be doing it, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. So once God has entrusted us with all of these resources, once we manage them wisely, we know that there is a reward waiting for us. In light of that, I have subtitled this presentation, Money, a Tool, a Test, a Testimony. Money as a Tool. Keith Webb said, money is a funny thing. It's paper and metal, yet has a powerful hold on us. We measure ourselves and others by how much we have. The truth is, money is a tool. Your life changes when you view, when you view money as a tool, not the goal. And I repeat, your life changes when you view money as a tool, as a tool not the goal. When we look at money as a tool, there are a number of things we can look at. The first is that we know that money is fundamental to our economic system. When the government 
gets in power and they have their meetings, they speak about their fiscal and monetary policies. And all of that basically surrounds how they're going to spend money, how they're going to budget, how they're, if they're going to raise taxes and lower taxes, whatever the case may be. When we get a job, we get a job so that we can get money at the end of the month, the week, whatever it is, so that we can provide for our family. We can provide, we can pay the taxes, we can build our houses, we can pay for our children's education, whatever the case may be. So I think we can we all agree that money is important. However, the way we view money is what really matters and the way we use it is what really matters. We often think, or some persons often think, that money can solve all of your problems. And if we look in our society, look on, on TV, we realize that it's all sometimes seem as if those persons who are making the most money have more problems than us, but yet still, we who may not have the money would say, okay, well, I need more money so that life can be much better. But I disagree in the fact that because you make more money, or because you would like to make more money, does not mean that your problems are going to go away. If you're going to make $1,000 extra, and you're in a bad situation right now, you're going to make $1,000 extra from next month, that doesn't mean that you're gonna have problems. Because the way you manage that money, whether it's $1,000 extra, or $50 extra, will determine how the problem that you are in, you will you will, you have to know how to manage it before you can eventually get more and really make the more work. Yes. Yes. It is important for us to, even though it is not wrong for us to say, okay, I would like to get a better job, I would like to make more money. There's nothing wrong with that. All of us have goals and aspirations. We have to be content in whatever we have. We have to make the best of whatever we have. When we can handle what we have, then God will allow doors to open for us so that we can get more. First, we have to change our mindset as it relates towards money. We should not be always thinking, oh, I need money for this, I need money for that, I need money for that. I need to make this much more money so that I can pay my bills or anything. If you make $2,000 a month, you have to know how to make that $2,000 work for you until, you until you are able to get more and to utilize it better. So when we think about trying to make the best of what we have, instead of focusing on our emotions, oh, I'm getting depressed because this budget is not balancing, I'm ending up in a deficit every month. When we use the money that we have to provide solutions rather than letting our emotions get the best of us, then we can plan properly. And that is where budgeting comes in. It is very, very, very important to budget. If you don't budget, you will not be able to use your money effectively. Yes, you may not budget and you may have money at the end of the month, but that doesn't mean that you're using the money the best way that you can. So it is very important to budget. And a lot of persons do not budget because they figure, okay, well, I know I'm not making enough money to pay my bills, so why budget anyway? But at the same time, you still go out and spend the money that you don't have, and then you can't pay your bills. So when you put it down on paper, when you think about all the expenses that you, that you have to make and the income that you're bringing in, when you do that, it allows you to adjust and make better decisions. You may need to cut your cell phone bill, your internet bill, whatever the case may be. And this is how we can better manage our money and change our mindset. While doing some research, this quote, I came upon this quote that was very interesting. It said, too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. <laughs> and as silly as it may sound, it is very, very, very real. And that is why it is important for us to plan and budget, so that we know exactly how we are spending our money and where we are going to use our money. Now the key to money management is simply contentment. When you are comfortable, no matter how much you own, 
you can be content with what you have and make it work for you. The key to contentment in one's finances is not the amount of money one makes, but rather the willingness to live within that amount. And finally, on money as a tool, Philippians 4, 11 and 12 states, which is a good pas passage on contentment. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now go on to money as a test. Luke 16, 11 to 12 states, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you, if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Wow. When we, as Christians, believe that God owns it all and that the decisions that we make in life should reflect our relationship with Christ, we will recognize that spending is a spiritual decision. How we spend our money is important to God. God has given us the wisdom and knowledge to, and the ability to go out there and get a job. We earn an income at the end of the month. But now how do we use that income that we have earned? Oftentimes, how we spend our money is based on what is our priorities, what is important to us. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you think about that car often, or you think about computers often, or phones often, you'll end up finding that I spend a lot of money making my car look good, or buying a new phone every time it comes out, or whatever the case may be. However, going back to budgeting, if we budget properly and plan how we're going to use our money properly, then we'll be able to make better financial and spending decisions. As Christians, we all agree that God, that God owns it all. So therefore, when we spend our money, because it is God's, how we spend it indicates our faithfulness to God. Amen. When we receive our paycheck, do we take out our tithes and offerings first, or do we pay our bills first and whatever is left after, we pay that as tithe or offering? And do we go out and buy alcohol or cigarettes? God condones that, and therefore, why should we go and spend his money to go and buy something that he doesn't want us to do? Um, how, do, how we use our money is an indication of our faithfulness to God. When we think about this, we can think about, thinking about money as a test. We think about situations at times that we may be placed in where, let's say you got a salary decrease and now you have to decide whether I should pay my rent or buy food or I should pay my tithe. And for some, that may be a very difficult decision to make. And that is where the test comes in, our faithfulness to God. How, what decision are we going to make with the limited resources that we have? We already didn't have enough, but now we have a salary cut. How are we going to use that? And I would say that no one can make that decision for you. Your relationship to God will allow you to make that decision for yourself. And hopefully that would be a decision that is pleasing to God. Simply knowing God owns it, God owns it all is not enough. Many of us know what we ought to do, but we disobey or we delay. 
We have emotional and intellectual faith, but not volitional faith. We know, but. So we know we're supposed to pay our tithes and offerings, but I don't have enough money to do that, so what do I do now? We make, we pray for that job so that we can get a better income. We receive that job, we get a better income. We already had a plan for that additional money. We get the job, but then the boss comes in and says, you have to work on a Sabbath. Or, he may, not even a Sabbath, he may say, okay, you have to work four hours on a, on a Sabbath each month. And you may say, okay, it's not every Sabbath, it's just four hours once a month. What do I do then? I prayed, I got the job, I'm probably even getting more money than I wanted to get, but here is it, I'm in the situation where I have to work on Sabbath. God seemingly answered my prayer, but now I have to work on a Sabbath. What do I do? And that is where our faith comes into test. We have emotional faith and intellectual faith because we let our emotions, the fact that, hey, I'm going to get this additional income that I'm going to be giving, able to give more to the church anyway, so that's a good thing, right? But working on Sabbath, I, you may, somebody may say, okay, well, it's only four hours on a Sabbath, so all is a Sabbath afternoon, so I can go to church Sabbath morning, whatever the case may be. But even though we know what we are supposed to do, we still have all of these other questions. And then we question, why did God answer this prayer, even though he, he, he answered the prayer that I prayed for, I'm going to get them extra income, but no, he's asking me to do something else. I want to remind us that when we are placed in situations like these, God doesn't answer prayers and then have us to go against his word. So when we are placed in situations like this, even though it may seem as if God answers our prayers, if there is any doubt, we should always turn to the Bible so that we can know how to make that decision. And then when we are placed in situations like these and we come out victorious, we do what is right, we can then have a testimony to share with others and to glorify God. Our attitudes towards wealth as a Christian becomes a testimony. Being content with what we have, our willingness to give tithes and offerings, and giving to those in need. And I said willingness to give to tithes and offerings, because we should not feel that giving a tithe is an obligation. We shouldn't say, okay, well, God said to give 10%, so I'm gonna give him the 10%, but I don't really want to. We ought to be willingness out of our heart, knowing that God continually provides for us. Amen. We should be happy when we give our tithe and offering, knowing that we can give back to God to further His cause and to help others in need. And since we are looking at money as a testimony, instead of talking about it, I'm going to open the floor to one person who may have a testimony as it relates to money or finances. If there's anyone who would like to give one testimony. It's always good to talk about God's goodness in your lives. Amen. In Psalm 105, 104, 103, talks about give thanks unto the Lord because he's good. It's not very long, but I've proven it over and over again in my own experience as a working professional that I make up a budget every month. And when I happen to use portions of my salary before I take out my tithe, I find that I'm off course in terms of my budgeting. But every month, that I make up my tithe, I know what I have for tithe and pastor, and I write that down, I go through my budget. Once I take that out, before I start spending, 
Guys, I'm never off course in terms of my budgeting plan. And it has worked for me over and over and over. And I know that if we honor God, he honors us in our response to his, his um, desire to give him first. And he will always open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings for us. And sometimes, you know, Sister Alfie, um, Aliti, I don't want to take your time. But we sometimes count blessings as just in monetary terms. If you're able to go through an entire calendar year without having the common full flu, that is a blessing in itself. So the blessing of health and contentment and having prosperity and so forth in terms of having favor with God and man are blessings from the Lord. Thank you, Sister Carr. And on that note, I would also like to share a personal testimony. Um, as some of you may know, I am self-employed. And that can definitely be a struggle at times, especially financially. But there was one situation where I, I lost a client and therefore I, the next month I will have less income. And I began to put the figures together and I did everything possible to see how I can rearrange stuff so that I can make, make all of my monthly obligations. And that just was not working. And at one point, I said, okay, well, I may just have to use my tithe and offering money to pay for my bills. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And the funny thing is that at that point in time, I was also treasurer. So it's like, here am I as treasurer who, um, encouraging people to be faithful in their tithes and offering, but yet still I'm making this decision not to give my tithes and offering. And I put down the piece, the, pen, the paper and pencil, I went to bed. I prayed about it, and the next morning my decision was made that on Sabbath I'm going to write that check and pay my tithes and offerings. I didn't know where I would get the additional income from, but I'm going to pay my tithes and offerings. That Sabbath came, the offering plate came around, I put in my tithes and offerings. And while I put that in, I said, Lord, I place everything in your hands. The next Monday, right and early, I got a call. Someone said, I understand that you provide accounting services, so I need to get a loan from the bank, so can you provide my, can you prepare my financial savings for me? I met with that person, we had our discussion, we um, came to a conclusion about how the fee and everything like that, and before I left that office, I had a check in my hand. I went to the car and I thanked God, and I said, Lord, I place everything in your hands and you provide it for me. Amen. 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 And even to those situations, sometimes later on we are placed in other situations and we begin to doubt again, would God provide for me? And this is where this statement comes in. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. So if God has done it for us in the past, why do you think he cannot do it for you again in the future? When we truly believe that God owns it all, we recognize that every single possession we have comes from some, someone else, that is God. We literally possess much, but own nothing. God provides me by sharing God benefits me by sharing his property with me. I have a responsibility to him to use it in a way that glorifies him. In summary, our mindset towards money determines whether we control the money we earn or we allow money to control us. Our relationship with God determines how we use our money and how we respond to difficult financial situations. Ultimately, when we allow God to take full control of our financial decisions, we receive the many blessings He has awaiting us. We can then bask in the bountiful blessings of God and glorify His name. And my closing thought 
it comes from Philippians 4, 6, and 7. A text that has new meaning for me based on situations that I had in the past. And it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. My prayer is that as we go through our lives, that when we make decisions, whether it be financial or whatever other situation it is, that we seek God, we know what we ought to do. Let us, let us remember to always do what is right, and God will continue to bless us. Amen.